I actually think Pete Gilbert was a higher level than any season Vince Carter had, except for that one awesome Ooh. 2001 season. Zach Lowe and I are redrafting the 2001 draft, which is one of the last drafts where just all hell broke loose. I'm going to um, give you the first pick. You're the guest. I think this is an easy one. Um, Pau Gasol is the first pick in the draft for me. Make the case. Do I, I mean, do I have to? It's Pau Gasol, yeah. that's, my, that's my case. I mean, the only competition is Tony Parker. Um, to me, the only competition is Tony Parker. It's Powell and Tony, and then it's everybody else. I assume you will be picking Tony Parker now. And I just think size, all-around skill. I, Powell was a good defender at his peak, an underrated defender at his peak. His passing, his ability to blend in any offense. Yes, it was funny. When we do these exercises, I'm kind of drafting like halfway for what the NBA was like then and halfway for what the NBA is like now. So, yeah, Powell, Powell's game, I think, is less fitted to 2020 NBA than like Tony Parker's game. Although Tony Parker never became an off the dribble three point shooter. Um, I just think Powell was better. I think peak Powell was better than peak Tony Parker, period. That's it. That's my case. They, they made the same number of all-star teams statistically. I mean, I, you know, they Powell had a few more points, Tony, whatever. I just, Powell, I just think Powell's better. Powell comes in as a rookie, puts up 17.6 points, nine rebounds, two blocks a game. 36.7 minutes a game. And Joe House is just going insane in Washington. <laughs> that they took Kwame Brown. He's going to these Wizards games and going, Kwame Brown looks like he needed like four more years in college. He needed to go to college and spend all four years there before something's going to happen. Powell is good immediately. And from 2002 to 2016, which is 15 years, and... 1,055 games. He played 35 minutes a game. He averaged an 18 and a nine and a half and almost two blocks. Six really time all-star, same, same as Parker. So I went back and forth really, really hard on this. And I gave, Parker was number one on my board. Wow. I like it. I mean, look, it's, it, you can make, you can make the argument. Peak Tony Parker was a, was a, an all NBA level player. I mean, peak Tony Parker was a great, great player. Here's my case. And this is just, you know me, I like to hold grudges and to ends and I, and slights. I never liked how Powell ended the Memphis thing. It really bothered me. I don't think he gets enough of a penalty for it in the historical thing. I think he was an incredible player. I really liked him. I thought he was the 2010 finals MVP. He never would have won it, but I thought he was the best player in that series. I thought he was absolutely immense in game seven, which was on recently. 19 points, uh, 18 rebounds. It's the most important game. It's the most important game of Pau Gasol's career in the NBA. That was that game. I sat behind the basket that they were scoring on in the second half for game seven. Cause I was doing like a live chat ESPN thing, which I, I wish I hadn't done. I wish I had written about that series instead of done the live chat thing. But Gasol was a fucking man in that game. He really was. And he's going against, there's no Kendrick Perkins because Perkins is hurt. He's going against KG, who's 85% of KG at that point, maybe 83. I have a lot of respect for Powell. I actually thought he was underrated, um, both on those Lakers teams and just as a pro. I didn't like the Memphis thing. And so... It, it was that little... I felt like it was like dead even between him and Parker. It's funny. The K- by coincidence, I just on Saturday did one of those NBA Instagram live things with Powell. Um, and I, I taught, so I prepared by talking to some people that know Powell and we were talking about Memphis and he was like super, super frustrated in Memphis, like the losing, they just weren't going anywhere. They won zero playoff games. They got swept every year in the playoffs. He was there. But when he got traded, somebody told me he was like actually unhappy. Like he, his first reaction about going to the Lakers is that he was upset and unhappy and like had kind of like like did i did i play this right and then very quickly right. he realized oh i'm on an awesome team and then pow pow talked about why he felt that way but it's interesting that we remember it as this as as this sort of frustrated guy trying to push his way out of town and then when it happens his first reaction is sadness more than elation well and i think there was a fear at that point of playing with kobe which cannot be understated you know he's he had had those three straight years and he was a difficult teammate and i'm sure he was like oh shit now it's like, I got my wish. I'm on a different team, but now the stakes are going to be completely different. He fit in immediately with that team, though. People told, I, uh, me, 
people, someone on that team told me no one ever, ever before or since picked up the triangle offense faster than Powell. It was just instant. Like he got it. He didn't need to be told anything. He understood it immediately. I just don't think Powell was a number one guy. Now I'm not sure Tony Parker was either, but I, the reason I, I had Parker slightly higher on my board was he was, he was such an unstoppable offensive guy for so long. Um, and like weirdly, you look back at the 13 finals, which we both covered. And there's that moment in game six when he's hurt, he's playing with like, he had a bad knee or a bad foot. I can't remember. And he just takes over with three minutes left. He's playing against one of the best teams we've had in the last 25 years. And he takes over the game and it seems like they're going to win because of all the stuff he's doing. I never felt like Pow was as good as Tony was in that kind of stretch or, or even Tony in 2014, Tony in the 07 finals, Tony's, Tony's kind of offensive apex was just, I felt a tad higher, but I honestly, I feel like this is one, a one B and I don't feel I like think, there's I a think wrong, it's close. Tony was, Tony was a 20 point score twice in his career. Um, the jump shot, the long, the three never really came. But he did. He had some monster playoff moments, and in Game One of that series in 2013, he hit the jumper to ice the game. I mean, he was a monster that year. I don't, you know, I just think Pat was better. They both made All NBA four times. It's it's, but it's an argument. So it's a it's a it's a tough argument. You have the third pick. Um. So if we had done this draft correctly, or if the the teams in the moment had done it correctly, Washington would have had Pat Gasol, and then we would have Tony Parker to the Clippers. I'm not sure that would have been great for him. The third pick seems pretty obvious to me, but I, I'm interested to see what you do here. Well, I'm going to I'm gonna reach a little bit because he didn't have the best career um, of, of uh, all of these people that are candidates for this pick. Um, but I'm going with the Zach Cram peak value method, and I'm picking Gilbert Arenas because I know that Gilbert Arenas, and in his prime, now maybe I can't prevent the knee injuries. I don't know. I can maybe prevent some of the uh, other unpleasantness that derailed his career in Washington. Yeah. Um, but I know, and if I'm drafting, like I said, halfway for then, halfway for now, I know I can plug Pete Gilbert Arenas into an NBA offense, and he can run 50 pick and rolls a game, make off the dribble threes, and be a guy that is going to make my team, on offense at least, really, really good. And so I'm drafting for peak value. I'm picking Gilbert Arenas third. I remember writing some column when he was on the Warriors and kind of not dismissing him, but just not giving him credit for being really an asset yet and getting a couple of impassioned emails back when people sent civil emails instead of just being like, you fucking suck, Zach. Yeah. Fuck you. It's a good uh, time. This is the era of like, hey, I'm going to send one of my favorite writers a thoughtful email that he might have gotten this one wrong. And I got all these emails from the Warriors fans saying, hey, you should watch Gilbert. Like Gilbert's coming on in a real way. Like something's happening here. And at that point, the Warriors sucked. I would, there was really no reason to watch him on League Pass unless I was like going to the game or there on TNT or something. I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll give Gilbert a whirl. And I was like, oh, what's this? And then that was the <laughs> year he was going to be, he was going to be a restricted free agent. Remember? They and changed they changed the rules because of his restricted free agency. There is now the Gilbert Arenas rule. Right. So Washington comes in, they come flying in off the top rope and they grab <laughs> Gilbert. And House is like, what's going on? I'm like, House, I've been I watched this guy a couple of times. This guy is like, this is an amazing move for you. You might have gotten whatever, but he was actually turned into a superstar. Like there is a probably a two year stretch there where he is on the level of T Mac and all these guys. And what's interesting is I actually think Pete Gilbert was a higher level than any season Vince Carter had, except for that one awesome Ooh. 2001 season. Hey, honestly, like if you're just talking about who did more offensively, you'd well, probably Pete, say Gilbert. Gilbert just brought more to the table. Pete Gilbert was 29 and six on like eight threes or seven threes a game, which in 2006, 2007, there weren't many people shooting seven or eight threes a game. Um, well, look at, that, look at his 2006 season and tell me the two things that jump out. Seven threes a game, seven attempted threes a game, 37% and 10 free throws, um, 10 and, free throws a game. Yeah. So he's basically, he's hardened. He's, like that he's basically Harden. James Harden in 2006, yeah. but there's no possessions back then. 
people remember how slow it was back then 29 and 6 and like i said like the the hardest thing to find in the nba is a legitimate offensive fulcrum who can be the number one guy every possession on an above average offense so i was he your pick for three if you had had three um you have the four it was either it was either him or joe johnson gilbert for three years from 05 to 07 was 28 and six you're talking three solid years peak value and i'm just i'm imagining that my team has a healthy team culture we're going to nurture all we're going to make all the right decisions off the floor on the floor we're going to we're going to we're not going to be we're not going to be the jailblazers. We're going to we're going to be not who's relevant for one of the picks that's coming up. Uh, we're going to have a good culture. I'm going to get the best Gilbert Arenas for a decent amount of time. 06 that series against Cleveland that was just kind of a strange that was a weird of really fun playoffs and that was a fun series. 6 games. He plays 47.3 minutes a game. Ridiculous. In the 6 playoff games. 34 points a game. Led the uh, led the playoffs that year, but went toe to toe with uh, with LeBron. LeBron. And one of one of the things I liked about him, and where I think, you know, he was All NBA third team, third team, second team for three straight years. Vince was Vince doesn't have anything like that three year stretch. One of the things I liked about him is he really honestly believed he was better than LeBron James in that playoff series. Those Wizards teams were just so. They wanted all of it. They wanted yeah, they all did. of LeBron. They wanted everything. Bring everything on. Um, I think that I don't think that's the wrong pick because you you at least know you're getting four top fifteen seasons of a guy. I thought uh, I had Joe Johnson, kind of three A three B with Gilbert. Um, a couple things with Joe. He he made seven All Star teams, which I was shocked by. He, so he only he, made he, one third team All NBA. His name is it is almost seven time all star Joe Johnson. I mean that's almost like how people refer to him for that reason because people look that up and just to see all like, the all stars wow. next to each other. I'm like, how did he make this many all star teams? Uh, the Joe first, Johnson, first, the Joe Johnson Hall of Fame debate is going to be frisky. It's going to be there's going to be people who are like Joe Johnson, and then they're going to be like, well, twenty thousand points, seven all star games, whatever, whatever it is. There's. It's going to be like if Joe, you you have to let in Joe Johnson and Tom Chambers if you're letting in Joe Johnson. Tom Chambers then has to get in, I think. But um, his first five Hawk seasons, 22, 5, and 6. I was shocked by his stats on the 05 Suns, a team that I really loved watching. He, uh, he was 47% from three that year, taking like five a game. And when he gets hurt, um, that to me, that's the big what if with Joe Johnson and the case for him for being the third pick in this draft is if he just stays with Steve Nash, just how about this? Stay with the best point guard and one of the best teammates we've had in the last 30 years on a style that's uniquely suited to all the things you're good at. Just stay there, stay there and be in contention. He goes to Atlanta and it's just like, or pay or pay right. him if blame the Suns, pay him keep him do whatever it takes to keep him because it is remarkable that you know the Celtics trade him as a rookie in that deal we talked about earlier and then the Suns when he's still very young are like yeah or you know they just can't work it out and so he ends up on this sort of like this NBA backwater at the time and the Hawks get really good that Hawks team like everyone sort of looks at them as this poster team for like upper crust mediocrity like you don't you don't want to be the Joe Johnson Hawks getting out in the second round all the time, but like that was a good team. There was like there was a good NBA team, and he was well. The key, the, the other thing with Joe Johnson, the contract kind of overwhelmed the That's second right. half of his career. That's he true. made so much money, and it was so ridiculous that he just became overrated. And he wasn't over. If you're just looking at him based on what do I want from the two guard position, oh, here's a guy who can score twenty to twenty two points a game, and he'll make four out of every ten threes. Like. Well, that's, that's good. What makes, Those that's are what good makes, things. That's what makes the next five or six picks interesting is that drafting from the perspective of 2020, you have Joe Johnson, Richard Jefferson, Shane Battier, Jason Richardson, wings who like now you'd be like, yeah, Joe Johnson can play two, three, four. Like they all shoot threes. They're multi-positional. And then you have like, you have some guys who are more old school, like Zebo or Tyson Chandler. Like, how do you? But had really great careers. So, how do I'm curious to see how we value those sort of attributes. 
the Joe Johnson thing with the Celtics is tough because you just like like him and if him and Paul Pierce together, it's not exactly the same, but it's it's reminiscent of the Tatum Brown combo they have now, where every team in the league would be like, "Oh, I'd love to have two wing guys like that." I would just build around those guys for ten years, and you look back retroactively and you go, "Oh, they had Paul Pierce and Joe Johnson, and they just could have had that for twelve years." That seems like they should want to do that. I had and Joe he Johnson. was gone I after had fifty. Two- yeah, I had Joe Johnson fourth on my board after Arenas. So we have the same top four guys in a different order, but I had Joe Johnson fourth. All right, so you're up, uh, you're up with the, the fifth, fifth pick. pick. Uh, I I went back and forth a lot of times on this for the reasons I just talked about, about position and versatility and all that. But in the end, I just thought the raw talent of Zach Randolph couldn't be denied at this pick. And even though... He's not sexy in the positional versatility. He's shooting threes. He actually got off to quite a slow start in his career uh, in Portland. But uh, I just think at some point you just have to say he's the best guy of these guys. He's the most talented guy. And I'll find a way either to play inside out around him or maybe I'll coax him into shooting threes way earlier in his career than he had. He didn't really shoot threes until the last couple of years of his career. Probably could have been a decent three-point shooter if, teams had actually directed his game that way and i will have a good healthy culture on my team for young zach randolph there is not going to be jailblazer shenanigans going on so i debated rj i debated battier as sort of like all shane battier does is win you know um i debated a couple other guys but i just went i at some point eight straight years averaging 18 points a game just a problem zach randolph was a problem and so i went zebo I had him there as well. 2010 guy for from 2004 through 2011. The thing, so it's funny. He got, He's at Portland, gets traded. Isaiah trades for him. Everybody's like, well, that's the dumbest thing ever. You're going to play Isaiah and Eddie. You're going to play Eddie Curry and Zach Randolph together. And Isaiah was doing that whole, the rest of the league's getting faster and has more shooting. I'm going to zig the other way. I'm going to get bigger. And it was a disaster I'm, immediately. I'm going bully ball. And it was like, wow. They, and all like the relatively smart basketball people are like, you can't play those guys together. they will never work. Defensively, you're going to get destroyed. Like, please don't do that. He tried I went it. Ba- I went back and read old clips and it was it was a trip to see New York Times era Howard Beck after 20 games writing columns like, yeah, scouts around the league are like one of these guys has to come off the bench because it's not working out with Eddie Curry and Zach Randolph and like David Lee is getting lost in the shuffle. It's a disaster. Oof. So he gets traded to the Clippers at season tickets. That was the year I almost gave up my season tickets after the season. I have a running diary of going to a game where it ends with Z- they're down two and Zach Randolph airballs a 29 footer coming out of a timeout to lose the game. And at that point there was, if Zach Randolph stock was like a penny, I would have not wanted Zach Randolph stock. I was just like, this guy's a loser. He puts up empty calorie stats on bad teams and that's where I'm landing. But you look at that Memphis, he goes to that's Memphis. That's how Memphis got him. Memphis got him and it's just it was straight salary dump. Like, please take Zach Randolph. There were Quentin Richardson was in that deal. There was like other stuff, but Memphis got him for essentially free. Right. They get him. But I think that 2011 season, he's 20 and 12 and then goes into the playoffs. And this is one of the lost great playoff upsets because we, the Spurs now from 11 through 14, there's this second Spurs run that's happening. And in 11, they get just derailed by this crazy Memphis team. That's a terrible matchup for them for whatever reason. I think they easily could have made the finals that year. 2012, they're about to make the finals and OKC taps into this unbelievable potential. They they end up not making it. 2013, they're up five with 28 seconds left, blow it. And then 2014, they finally win. But man, if you look back at that Spurs run, the over-under for titles is easily two. It might even be two and a half considering what else happened in the league at that point. And this 2011 it was fucking bonkers. Memphis not only upset them, it was legitimate. It was like if those teams played 20 times, I think Memphis wins like 14 or 15. It just everything about it was a bad matchup. All right. So I you had got the six the, pick. You got the six pick, and now it gets really interesting, I think. So we went Pau Gasol, Tony Parker, Gilbert Arenas, Joe Johnson, Zach Randolph. 
I am taking Tyson Chandler with the six pick. Ooh. And here's my case. I think his career, if you played it 20 times, this is probably one of the worst versions of it. He goes to that weird Chicago team. Um, nothing goes right. Just, you know, hurts his back. That's a huge setback. Um, gets traded to New Orleans. He's with Chris Paul. Great. This is this is going to be awesome. Has a couple good New Orleans years for them. In 08, he was almost tw- he was 12 and 12 in the regular season. Uh 62% shooting. And then at some point he ends up on he, he ends up on Charlotte. But then if you remember, there's this unbelievable fork in the road moment with him where OKC Oklahoma trades City. for him. Yeah. And then vetoes the trade because of a physical. And he almost ends up on this team with Ibaka, Durant, and Westbrook as the Kendrick Perkins piece. They st- would have kept Jeff Green or traded him for somewhere else. So there's a couple forks in the road there where I just feel like, man, in a different situation, he's better. I also think as like a screen and roll guy in 2020, if you take mid-2000s Tyson Chandler, I think uh, something happens there. Two other cases for him. He's third team All NBA in 2012 for the Knicks, and then in the in the Dallas series, even though the stats don't really measure the full impact, he's one of the reasons they won that Dallas the uh, Miami Finals with uh, the defense of him and Marion and just the way they were able to just continue was, to build a wall. He was insanely good in those finals defensively. Yeah, insanely good, and he won Defensive Player of the Year once for the Knicks, um, probably in and that then same the, All NBA season. So he's basically he's basically a 10 and 10 from the 2003 season all the way through 2017. He's 11 and 12 for those uh, 15 years. And I just, I like the longevity and I do think that, it, and he's also a great teammate, beloved teammate by all accounts, right? Did you ever hear not a lot of bad Tyson Chandler stuff out there? I was no, like his teammates liked them. Phoenix had, was probably a little rough. Phoenix was rough. Um, I, you know, Dallas round two, he had a, he had moments in Dallas round two for the 2014, 15 maps. I, I ended up, he's, taking, he's basically at a different point in his career at that point. Yeah. Anyway, I, I ended ahead. up taking him much lower than you, not much lower, but a few spots lower than you did because really? I think you nailed, I think you nailed it right. The first thing you said, if you play out his career, this is one of the worst versions of it. Like he wasn't good in Chicago. And like if you boil down Tyson Chandler's career, the highs were really high. Like he's an NBA champion, he's a defensive player there. He's a crit- he's the keystone of an NBA championship defense. But his game never changed at all, right? Like this if you have Tyson Chandler, this is how you have to play on offense. He just has to screen and roll, that's it. You can't play any other style. He can't do anything else. And but he did that great. And you're really getting like if you boil it down, he, he had five good seasons. Maybe six. The two New Orleans seasons with CP and then Dallas Knicks Knicks. And after that, the decline kind of came fast. And given his his one dimensionality on offense and his relatively maybe abbreviated peak, I had him a little bit lower, but I love Tyson Chandler. So I I, you know, I I don't feel strongly about my six, seven, eight, nine order, but I did I had him lower than you did. One thing I one thing with Chandler I forgot to mention. I think if he had a really good point guard, it's a little like DeAndre Jordan St- and and Marcus Camby. There's certain guys who it's like if if you if they're just the recipient of somebody else's brilliance, they actually are going to even be much better. And the stuff I thought he was great on those New Orleans teams, but well, he's playing with Chris if Paul. You're a lob, if you're a lob catcher and you're playing at that time with the best lob thrower in the NBA, and David West is a stretch four, and Stojakovic is involved, like you're just going to be rolling into open space. And you're going to thrive. And the same thing with Mavs. Like, smart offense, Dirk at the four. Like, you're going to be rolling into open space. All right, you're up. Seven pick. Uh, I went... Now you get to... Since you've taken Tyson Chandler off the board, now you get the three wings who I have all right next to each other and Richard Jefferson, Shane Battier, and Jason Richardson. Yep. I flirted with taking Battier here because of just how long he was like a, an elite stopper on defense and one of sort of the, not original, but one of the like version 2.0 of three and D guys. Um, but I just, I, I went with Richard Jefferson in this spot because I, just oh thought, wow. I just, thought, I, had... <laughs> I just thought he's, he's, uh, 
20 point scorer three times in his career, seven straight years, 15 plus. Feel like decent defender that I could have got to defend at an elite level. If in like multi positional, no all star teams. None of these guys ever made any all star teams. Um, but I, I just thought upside. I'm taking RJ as a two way player who can create off the dribble and run and transition. Maybe post up the occasional mismatch. Can do way more on offense than Shane Battier can do. Was a good three point shooter. So I went upside of Richard Jefferson. Um, plus, the, the plus you of- get old. You get old, Richard Jefferson. You get 2016 Finals KG veteran who could actually play in a game seven, Richard Jefferson. The, but the, the the like from age 29 to that Finals was rough for Richard. Like the, when the decline happened, it came fast. Like Spurs era Richard Jefferson, Warriors era Richard Jefferson. Like it wasn't it wasn't great for a while. So I went. But I went RJ in this spot at seven. Beloved teammate, too. I I thought the I had Jason Richardson the highest of those three. I'm gonna make. The I had case. I had him the lo- I had him the lowest. Interesting. Of those three. I'll be interested. Maybe we should do a Twitter vote. Who would you in the redraft? We could put those three guys because I, I had the same thing. I had those three guys together. I was trying to figure it out. Here is the case for uh, Richardson. So you take Richardson eight then. In this, yeah. in this mock draft. I'm taking okay. him eighth. Um, 07 Warriors. Had some monster I thought he, games. He had some monster games in the We Believe run. Electric team in the uh, playoffs, 11 playoff games, 39 minutes a game. He was 19 and seven. Took seven and a half threes a game in the 07 playoffs. So I felt like if you're extending him forward into how we play basketball now, it'd be even better because, you know, he's jacking up. I, the thing that really pushed it over the top for me, other than, you know, I just think he was a better, the best player of those three guys. Like just, you know, he averaged 22 a game for Golden State in 06 yeah. for yeah. seven, five games. But I remember I was friends with Steve Kerr by the time the 2010 Suns team really rolled into a team that almost made the finals and unexpectedly in a lot of ways. And I remember when they traded for Richardson, just talking to Steve about it at the time, and he was like, this guy's such a good player. We had no idea. And I knew Nash a little bit at that point because we were doing third for 30. He was like, we had no idea Richardson was this good. He just, not only does he fit in with all the stuff we love to do, but we can actually like throw him the ball and he can create a shot. And you look at the uh, the playoffs that year, they played 16 playoff games and he was 20 and five. He's 47.5% from three. So he's another guy that I, if you played his career 20 times, I wonder how many times there's a better version of what we ended up with where yeah, basically he's, he's golden state in Charlotte for the first eight years of his career. Those teams sucked. I don't, you know? I don't quibble with it. I, you could throw these three wings in any order you want. I had them all ahead of Tyson Chandler just because I'm drafting with a little bit of an eye on 2020 versatility. Um, I just, I, I just, I never quite trusted Jason Richardson in a big spot. I just, I, mm. for some reason, I never, I just never, maybe I'm, maybe the missed box out he had for Phoenix in game five of those conference finals when our test tips in the, the Kobe air ball, his coloring perception of him. But I, the, we believe thing was like found money. That was just feel good, fun times. And they were a really good team. Um, I just, I just kind of never trusted Jason Richardson in like a, just a big, big, big spot. Never trusted him. So I had, I had him after Battier. So I will then take Battier with, what are we at? The ninth pick? I'll take Battier ninth. Uh, Battier ninth pick. I think it's fair. I think it's good value. I think a uh, couple things have to be mentioned just quickly with him. He's basically the, the George Washington of advanced metric basketball players, right? The Michael yeah. Lewis piece about why Daryl chose him over Rudy Gay. The no, he, the no he, stats all-star. Right. He becomes the money ball, baseball, whoever the guys on the Oakland A's were that Michael Lewis wrote about. For that, Scott um, Hatterberg. I, uh, his 2012 finals game, I'm um, sorry, 2013 finals game seven. They needed somebody to get hot who wasn't LeBron James, somebody to make some threes. It was either going to be him, Mario Chalmers, or Ray Allen. And if one of those three guys didn't make some threes, they're losing. And he got hot. But remember, we were working that year. And remember, we talked to him during that finals. Remember how bummed out he was? He wasn't, he wasn't playing. playing. He went, he went, he was like barely playing. And, and we were asking him like, what's going on, man? You cool? And he just had that look like, 
there's so much I want to say, but I'm not, I don't want to upset the apple cart, but well, I'm so this, fucking mad I'm not playing. Look at this game log. Last three games against Indiana in the conference finals, eight minutes, four minutes, DNP. First four games of the finals, six minutes, five minutes, eight minutes, eight minutes. Then he's up to 17 and 12. And then in game seven, 29 minutes, six threes. That's a and, crazy game seven. And honestly, that's why they win because that game was was a two point game with a minute left at San Antonio the ball. And if he doesn't make, if he, if he goes zero for eight or one for eight, they lose. So Good. yeah, so I I had him. I just think Shane Batty is a winning basketball player. So I had him a little higher. Me too. But I will take. I had him seventh on my board. But I will gladly accept him with the ninth pick in this draft. I so can't you had wait Chandler to, I, and Richardson. Yeah, I I, I went Battier. I went RJ six, Battier seven, J Rich eight, Tyson Chandler nine. I can't wait to see who you pick ten. Well, for everyone scoring at home, there's now a drop off. We have now entered yes. the Ger- Gerald Wallace, Memo Okor, Troy Murphy, Eddie Curry, Vlad Radmanovich, Kwame Brown, Sam Dallenbear, Jamal Tinsley, Earl Watson, Carlos Arroyo. Yeah, we can probably speed. Draft. We can probably speed through. Yeah, we're we're face. we're we're in the home stretch. I uh, I really enjoyed Memo Okor. Yes, and I, I'm I taking him tenth. I, I thought I was gonna reach and have him tenth. He's a no brainer tenth pick. It's it's a guy that for a couple years there was was first of all he finished his career as a 14 and seven, which I was surprised by. But then you look at some of the three point stats, dude. He was good. On, uh, yeah, and an 08 and 09 combined. Oh, let's throw in 2010 too, actually. Uh, so three years on Utah, competitive teams, and he's 40% from three, taking 3.3 a game, 15 and seven. But you think like nowadays with basketball, he'd be like coveted, right? He There'd would be like be, 10 teams after Memo, Memo Accor. He would be a, like he was and now would be even more in elite, uh, like a really good stretch five. Like Memo Okor was a really good stretch five. That's what he would be. He would be bombing threes. He would be, on offense, he would be Brooke Lopez, except he would be taking twice as many threes. On defense, he would not be Brooke Lopez, but that he would be a dangerous, dangerous player. So I had him 10th, no, no brainer. 2008 playoffs, 12 games. They lose to the Lakers, round two. 15 and 12. Those Utah teams that, were fun with Boozer and Okor and D. Will. Those were fun teams. 15 and 12 took 4.33s a game, 37% from three. So a little ahead of his time. Who knew? Memo Okor. Uh, a Mike Budenholzer kind of coach would get him today and be like, you're taking 12 threes a game. You're gonna, we're just right. going to pick and pop every play, and you're going to take a million threes. And he got hurt. But he's the other piece with him was he was on the Pistons originally. Yep. And they kind of fucked it up, and they got rid of him. And he's somebody that would have helped them in the mid two thousands as they, you know, went down some of the yeah, bigger he, series. He's, a tra- they played. he's one of those guys where if you have him and you keep him, you're able to transition more smoothly from one era to the next without as much of a, a drop off. So I had him tenth too. So I get to pick eleventh. By the way, he played in an all star game. Was good. Memo was good. Like I, I thought about, I thought almost half for fun and half for serious. I thought about taking him even higher than this. All right, who do you have? Uh, what pick is this? Eleven? Yeah, 11. eleven. I went uh, Gerald Wallace. Uh, just, just if we could ever get the shooting a little better, the value, like just a guy who can guard everywhere, and was a you know, off the court. I think uh, the stories about his diet, his habits are pretty well known. Like I, I, but I think on my team, we would have been ahead of the curve with personal chefs like delivering stuff to his house in the off season. I would have made Gerald Wallace a, a better three point shooter. And just you throw in the defense like Gerald Wallace was good, man. I, I have no I'm fine with him at this pick. What was the I don't remember the diet stories. What was he it? Is he like well. just an like, eat a I hot think, dogs guy? Yeah, I think he, I think he was a bad eater. And uh, and I would have rectified that. He was a really good. player. I think when he when he kind of declined fast, people were not, yeah. people in the league were not surprised that he declined fast, like after age 30. So he got Rod Strickland Maybe. There was, I was playing fantasy all, all the 2000s. That 2010 season he had, he had some good Charlotte. Those Charlotte teams were weirdly competent there for a couple of years. Captain Jack was involved there a little bit. Yeah. Um, but he, he averaged 10 rebounds a game in 2010. He was 18 and 10. But I remember 
He had a couple of games that year where he have like 25 rebounds or like some crazy number. He'd be like, Jared Wallace? He's, he was a I was player. Saying, how? You put, a little, you put a little guy on him, he could mash him in the post. Like prime Gerald Wallace could do a lot of stuff. We can't let a Gerald Wallace section of the podcast go without bringing up one other piece. Damian Lillard? Yeah. Free player draft. All right. Uh, 12th pick. I only have one guy left on my board and then it gets dark. I, I thought Troy Murphy had a couple good years. We are we are in lockstep. Lockstep. Yeah. Troy Murphy is like the the slightly JV memo or cur. If he were today, people would just make him a stretch five. He would shoot a ton of threes and he was a really good shooter. So, as you know, my dad loved any left-handed white guy who reminded him of Dave Cowens was is the quickest way to my dad's heart. My dad was very upset when they didn't take Troy Murphy with the 11th pick in 2001, the Celtics. And then as it became pretty clear pretty quickly that Kedrick Brown was destined for Yugoslavia or Spain or Russia or whatever country he was going to end up playing in, there was a Troy Murphy year, 05, yeah. He puts up 15 and 11 for Golden State and shoots almost 40% from three, too. He's like sneaky good three-point shooter. Um, and then became openly good when he got to Indiana because they actually had him shoot the threes. And my dad was just furious about Troy Murphy. You would have thought Troy Murphy was like the next Larry Bird. So, oh, man, we missed that. So his career didn't quite pan out that way. But, man, if you look at his 2009 season when he's 14 and 12, and he's taken five threes a game, shooting 45% from three. For his career, is a 39% three-point shooter. I, he would have had a better arc now. So, Trey Murphy, underrated. Yeah, I had of. him no, easily 12th pick. And I thought about taking him higher, but I just couldn't. But, yeah, he would just shoot a lot of threes. That's why my 13th pick, we're, getting, we're entering the part of the draft where I'm just defaulting to, like, can you do one thing really well? And is that one is thing rough. shooting, right? It's sad. So, I took my 13th, I took Radmanovich. Because I was just like, I know this guy, plug and play, he's a, he's a four, he can sh shoot threes. Like, could he be Davis Bertans now in the NBA? Just launch tons of threes. Not quite that quick a release, maybe, but I just defaulted to, I know what this guy is. He's good at the most important thing. I'm taking him. Career 38% three-point shooter. I also had him 13th. So now I have the last pick, unless you want a 15th pick. No, go ahead. Um, so... It's basically Eddie Curry or Sam Dallenbear. So, so I had two enticing choices. Sam plays 886 <laughs> games, peaking with a 10 and 10 on the 08 Sixers. Um, bounced around in a really insane way. Somehow played for six teams. Eddie, the case for him is that there, there's that, that one Eddie Curry season where he is... <laughs> <laughs> your your the case 05, is falling apart quickly. That one season. The 05 Bulls where he's putting up 16 a game in 28 minutes. Um, but I mean that you just can't win with Eddie Curry. So I'm taking Sam Dallenbear. I had uh, we we had I had Dallenbear for him. I I think he was a uh a, a good all-around player who could do who was a good shot blocker, had a little bit of touch, like a tiny bit of touch that if nurtured correctly could have been like a decent pick and pop touch, um, right. ran the floor, good feel for the game. I took him over Eddie Curry. Eddie Curry, it, the plus minus stats were ugly, even when he was putting up numbers, um, just because defensively, I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to take into account the health issues that were the reason the Bulls ended up trading him to the Knicks in like an all time New York Knicks bad trade. Um, but I took Dallin Bear as well. So the, so that means picks, one and four do not make our revised top 14. Kwame Brown or Eddie Curry. Yeah. Not to mention Eddie Griffin. And um, Tusana Jop, Rodney White, Kedrick Brown all fall out of uh, Eddie Griffin. All fall, Which I, did, I didn't know what to do with Eddie Griffin, but they all fall out of the lottery. So we went. Gasol one, Parker two, Arenas three, Joe Johnson four, Zach Randolph five, Chandler six, Richard Jefferson seven, Jay Rich eight, Shane Betty eight, nine. Yes. Memo O'Kerr, big winner of this pod, 10, Gerald Wallace 11, Troy Murphy 12, Rad Manovich 13, Dallin Bear 14. Zach Lowe, glad you're staying safe. Thanks for coming on. Pleasure as always. Always a pleasure, my friend. <laughs> 